interesting. We have a lot of Zoom followers who are still coming um, in and we're oversubscribed on Zoom. So it's also being live streamed on YouTube. And just to warn you, it is being uh, recorded. So uh, uh, watch anything I do or say. And on that front, I ask everybody who's not speaking to go on, uh, on mute. Um, now, this is our latest meeting of the all-party group, timed specifically to coincide with Mental Health Awareness uh, Week, where there's a particular focus on involving uh, infants and children in uh, mental health uh, care during this week. So lots of other activities that many of you will have been and are being involved in um, this week. Um, so we're going to hear a series of presentations. If you remember at the last meeting, we had a presentation from my colleague, Andrea Ledson, just ahead of her publishing the Ledson Review, which I'm glad to say out, made quite a, uh, an impact, has done exceedingly uh, well, and a very substantial piece of work, which has now been adopted as government policy, and Andrea's working with a team of civil servants to bring that to uh, reality. So some really exciting things in, in there that I'm sure uh, all of us would uh, subscribe to, and now it's a question of making sure it becomes reality as soon as possible. So real progress that is being um, made and, and I'm very grateful to all those who contributed to that uh, review and helped make it uh, happen. Now I'm gonna hand over in a minute to uh, Sally Hogg, who's the coordinator of the First Thousand One Days um, Movement. As I say, if everybody can go on uh, mute, um, we will have, uh, if everybody keeps to their timings, um, around half an hour festivals and discussion at the end, we're due to finish at um, 11. Uh, if you have questions, could you please table them in the Q&A uh, facility and between Sally and I, we'll try and um, pick them up, as many of them as we can, at the, uh, at the end. So if you table them uh, there, that will be helpful. If anything goes wrong, put a comment in, uh, in chat, but I should be looking for the questions in the, uh, the Q&A um, facility. Um, so I think that is it. What could possibly go wrong? So far, technology is working. If it comes to presentations and things, we will touch wood and see what, uh, see what happens. But let's get started. And uh, as again, as, as to say again, you're very welcome, uh, everybody. It's great to see so many people taking such interest in this whole um, issue. So now I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Sally to get things going. Sally. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. Um, as Tim said, it's in for Mental Health Awareness Week this week. Um, and we're talking particularly about including infants in children and young people's mental health and tackling what we've been calling the baby blind spot. The idea that often when we think about children, we don't think about the youngest children. Um, today, we're focusing particularly on um, a set of reforms um, that are going through in the health and care bill um, and what those are gonna deliver for the first 1,001 days. Um, this was an issue which we discussed at a parliamentarians meeting of the APPG and they were keen to pursue further. Um, so I'm just going to set the scene very quickly. Um, I think there are three reasons why we need to care about what the health and care bill um, is going to do to the system um, if we care about getting things right for babies and toddlers and their families. The first is that we know that um, there are lots of services and lots of commissioners involved in services in the first thousand one days and so coordination and accountability at a local level are really important and therefore the duties on different organisations to cooperate and the clarity of, of leadership within that matter very much in terms of getting that coordination and accountability right. The second thing um, is that we know that very often local systems focus on what feels to be more urgent, that might be child protection systems, it might be uh, acute care in the NHS and so there's a real need when we've got local partners together to coming together to think about their priorities that there's some kind of explicit push on them to think about young children within that and we've got some fantastic examples of this today of local systems that are doing that. The third reason why we need to care about this is because we've currently got a system where there is um, to coin a phrase a postcode lottery where you are born as a baby depend um uh, determines very much the care that you will receive and your family will receive um, and in order to tackle some of that local variation a number of different things are, are needed funding and, and, and various things but one of them is that kind of accountability and the clarity of responsibility in the local system so that action can be taken 
and um, to put pressure on local areas where they're not prioritizing the needs of, of babies. And just to touch on that, um, we are uh, publishing a set of evidence briefs tomorrow, which will be available online, um, which cover a number of aspects of provision available in the first thousand one days. And one of them looks specifically at this issue of local variation. The Parent Infant Foundation, um, we've re have released new research just this weekend that shows that only half of local areas feel that they've got a mental health service um, that would take referrals for not twos. So we've got that kind of real baby blind spot in some areas in their CAM services. Similarly, as Alison will talk about next, there's huge variation in what health visiting services are doing, both in terms of how many families they're seeing and also what that contact feels like, whether that's just a letter through the post or whether it's a meaningful face-to-face -face service. Um, children's centres we know have been decimated in some local areas, but um, saved in others. And similarly, this map on the slide of family hubs shows just how variable that provision is around the country. So there's a real need to tackle that. Now, there's a number of things, as I said, that are needed. One of those is about funding. We know that funding has been cut more in our most disadvantaged areas, and that is leading to differences in local provision. But there's also an issue of what local areas are um, deciding to do and what local decision makers are prioritising. That's come out very clearly in the research and what um, legislation and statutory guidance and central government action can do is to help nudge those decision makers to make sure that they are thinking about the not twos. So our checklist for the health and care bill is around will the legislation help to facilitate coordination between local partners? Will it help ensure clarity of accountability? Will it put babies and toddlers clearly on the priority list? And will it help to address local variation in provision? Um, it, there is a huge opportunity here to get all of those things in a better place. But there's also a risk that if the legislation doesn't do those things, it might actually make uh, take us backwards. Um, it might actually kind of damage some of the existing structures as, as the kind of system is thrown up and reorganised again and, and, and given think, different things to think about. So that's why we really need to care about the health and care bill. And, and I'm thrilled that we've got the team from the Department for Health here today to talk about what the bill will do. I noticed um, Andrea logged in while I was talking and it's great to see you here today, Andrea. I, I, I obviously need to kind of cross-reference with what the Start for Life review um, says. Um, because that really, it makes those points. It says about the fact that there is real variability in local provision, and we do need to make sure that the Start for Life offer and the Start for Life responsibilities are clear part of what integrated care systems are doing. Um, and the bill is obviously a chance to actually make that happen and to tie all of this together. Um, if we are uh, going to see new uh, statutory guidance around what ICSs should do, then there's an opportunity in that to make clear these responsibilities around the first 1,001 days. So um, our agenda today, we've got Alison who will be following from me talking specifically about local differences in health visiting, because obviously that is an area where we see this huge variation in local provision and, and differences in priorities and decision-making. We've got um, Debbie from Camden and Trudy, Vicky and Catherine from Surrey, who are going to talk about local systems that are putting babies at the heart of what they're doing and what can be delivered if we get this right. Um, and then we've got Philippa and Dorian from the Department for Health and Social Care, who are going to talk about the bill and what it's doing and what opportunities there are um, through that legislation. So I'm going to stop now and hand over to Alison. Great, thanks so much, Ellie. Right, if this all works. I should be able to share my screen. Technology. <laughs> there, is that working? Great. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you so much, Tally and Tim and Andrew for inviting me uh, to present today on local differences in health visiting, where you live really does matter. Um, when I'm asked about the state of health visiting, it's a really difficult question to answer because actually there are as many versions of health visiting as there are local authorities in England. And the answer really does depend on where you live. And we have huge amounts of unwarranted variation. Of course, we need to remember that the picture is quite different in the devolved nations where they have seen investment in the health visiting service. So why does this matter? It matters because we're all agreed that giving every child the best start in life is, is a huge ambition that we should strive to as a country. Uh, Levelling up is important because disadvantage starts early, the effects are cumulative, and they really can last a whole lifetime for some of these children if they're not addressed. 
So I thought I'd start by just uh, unpacking what we mean by unwarranted variation and start by looking at outcomes. It's important to remind ourselves that actually collectively compared to other countries, similar countries across the world, we're not doing particularly well. In 2020, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health highlighted that we have widening inequalities and a poor state of child health and well-being. Our progress is stalling or reversing in important areas and we have inequalities. Um, our under five mortality rate is the second highest in Western Europe. We also, now this is a really hard hitting fact, and I don't think many people are aware of this, we have the highest rate of homicide for any age group is in babies under the age of one. Just think about that for a moment. Uh, we know the Children's Commission has told us we have 2.3 million children living with risk because of vulnerability, and a third of those are invisible to services, and young babies are the most invisible. And sadly, our child protection statistics are all going in the wrong direction. So just to move on, looking at outcomes across England, uh, we have unwarranted variation in outcomes between local authorities. The tables and maps on this slide show data from PHE fingertips, which show unwarranted and unexplained variations across all indicators, even when we look at statistically matched areas where you would expect them to be doing the same. Um, as well as variation in output, we also have variation in input, and this is very significant for health visiting in particular. Uh, the map on the left shows the health visiting caseload size and only the areas in dark green have the recommended caseload number of 250 children or lower per health visitor. The pale green have up to 400 and everything from purple onwards have cases of 400 or more children under five with the darkest purple areas having cases of more than a thousand. So let's just think about how difficult that might be for a health visitor to have more than a thousand children on her caseload. And this is relevant because caseload size is a proxy measure for the amount of time that health visitors are able to give a family. So if you're a mum struggling, a parent struggling, what you're looking for is time, somebody to get alongside you. And it's also worth remembering that uh, Family Nurse Partnership, we've all recently celebrated their excellent outcomes, have caseloads of 20 to 25 uh, children on their caseload. So what you put in really does matter. Um, and then COVID has come along and made things an awful lot worse. So we've got a uh, huge unwarranted variation again in the rate of redeployment in health visitors. The range was from zero to 63%. So imagine you working in an area where you already have an enormous caseload and now 63% of your colleagues depart to, to do a different front line. Um, very strong, difficult times for health visitors. Um, we've also got unwarranted variation in, in what we do and how we do it and how we do health visiting really matters. So you can see across the top uh, variation in the percentage of health reviews completed by a health visitor. Uh, the graph down at the bottom left shows variation in uptake of the 12 month health review. Um, what the, along the bottom, it's got index of multiple deprivation and a percentage up the side. And what you can see is there's absolutely no correlation. It's a total scattergun, or as Andrea yourself, you called it the wild west of health visiting, of who gets an offer and who takes up the offer. This is a quality issue and it's important, it matters. Um, and then we've got variation in the evidence base uh, that, that some uh, areas practice from. So one example is sending ages and stages questionnaires through the post. Uh, we know that some areas are using this as the only method of completing their health review. When actually, when the ages and stages was brought in, it was brought in as a population measure. It's not a screening tool. It hasn't got sufficient levels of sensitivity. Uh, so the bottom line is that we'll be missing children if that's all we do. We're wasting stamps sending these through the post unless we're having health visitors come alongside families and work through the questionnaire with them in the way it was intended. Uh, and then COVID came along and brought significant additional challenges for health visiting, like all other parts of the healthcare system. We've seen increasing need, a backlog of work not done. And it's worth saying that health visitors didn't stop and they won't stop. Maybe they haven't been seen by many families, but they've been prioritizing the most vulnerable. But the punchline is that sadly, they, in most areas, there are just not enough health visitors to meet the levels of need. Uh, health visitors went above and beyond. We've seen huge examples of fabulous case studies where they really have made a difference. But most health visitors are telling us they're only reaching the tip of the iceberg. This is a worry to them. Prioritization has a human cost. There are families that are facing the brunt of this. And some fat families, rightly so, have started to make complaints on social media saying that health visitors have bowed out. And just to say that actually this isn't the failure of a single health visitor or a commissioner or a manager. 
uh, but the predicted consequence of years of cuts to the health visiting service. So human cost uh, is a tragedy for every baby and young family um, uh, not receiving the services they need. And this is why it really matters because the cost of failing to intervene is enormous. Now I'm told actually, as I'm trying to make the case for health visiting, that no one really cares actually about the human cost, which is a really sad message to hear, because actually it really matters to health visitors. And I'm sure many people that are on this call today, the human cost matters. But even for those hard nosed people who don't seem to care and aren't moved by this, you cannot ignore the economic case, which is compelling. This is not hypothetical. Early intervention is cheaper in the long run, much, much cheaper. And on this slide, I've just set out some of the priorities across government priorities for children, priorities set out in the Health Visiting Child Programme. I've only costed a few, but just to run through, a perinatal mental health unmet need, £8.1 billion pounds a year, domestic abuse, £66 billion, uh, child maltreatment, £17 billion, the cost of obesity just to the NHS is £6.1 billion, to wider society, £27 billion. Um, and, and this really shows the cost of late intervention and then compare this to the 700 million pound cut from the public health grant and it absolutely pales into insignificance. And I'm going to quote you, Tim, uh, you said, I'm not sure what the government were hoping to save by cutting the public health grant like this. Uh, so what do we need to make things better? Well, COVID has given us this opportunity to actually stop and pause and look at this with fresh eyes. Where are we heading? Where do we want to be in five years or 10 years? And let's really start building back better now. It's really encouraging to see the work of the Early Years Review, looking at this from the perspective of a whole government perspective. Uh, the benefits of early intervention accrue to numerous government departments, not just Public Health England, where the grant comes from. Uh, and from my perspective, and I hope you will agree, health visiting is an important part of the solution. We know it's not the whole solution, uh, but many have described health visiting as the glue. And we need to take a whole systems approach at this, uh, starting with prevention, stopping problems happening in the first place, early identification, vulnerable families aren't queuing up saying, I want to join a group. They need somebody to get alongside them, build a relationship, identify need. Uh, broken engagement into intervention and then providing that vital safety net for babies and young children. So just to come to a close, uh, how do we get there? Well, we need to act now. Health visitors have seen the reality of the pandemic on uh, babies, young children and their families. They've seen them, they've looked these people in the eye and seen them. They worry about the ones they're not seeing as well. So we need to collectively recognize that this is a um, a huge problem for us uh, and, we, and we need to tackle it. There's a large amount of unmet need out there with wide inequalities. There's, there's lots of evidence uh, for this. We can't say we didn't know, we did know. We knew from April last year that, that babies were being missed and we need to act now. Uh, we know enough about what works to make a difference now. And what this requires is, is a plan with investment to prioritize public health and early intervention now. And for health visiting, we need more health visitors. And this requires funding, a workforce plan, and a focus on tackling this wild west of unwarranted variation. And so to, to finally to end, to say building back better is more than infrastructure, it's more than bridges. We need to invest in our human future, which makes sound economic sense. Thank you. Alison, thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for keeping to time so far so, uh, so well. Uh, we should congratulate Alison who recently took over uh, as the director of the Institute of uh, Health Visiting, uh, taking over from the uh, legendary Dr. Cheryl um, Adams, and I'm sure uh, with a fantastic uh, job. So thank you very much for setting the scene on the Health Visitor Front, um, uh, Alison. We're now going to go to various local authority examples of where they get it, and they've already been doing a lot of what we've been talking about for some time. So we're going to start off in the London Borough of Camden, and we've got Debbie Adams, who's the Head of Integrated Early Years Services in Camden, to uh, talk to us about their experiences there. Debbie. Good morning, thank you. I'll just try and share my screen. Okay, is that okay? Yep, that's worked, well done. Yep. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so, uh, morning everybody and thank you for the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in Camden. Let's try and move my screen a lot.
Okay, so I thought I'd start by describing Camden's early years service, as I know, and people have already mentioned, that there are almost as many different models as there are local authorities. So our approach um, in Camden is to view everything really from pregnancy to school being within the scope of our partnership. Um, some things we commission like health visiting through the public health grant, some services we work in partnership with like Camden with free colleagues, and we offer support also to our um, independent childcare providers and such so that we can sustain a high quality early education service. So we really do take a, you know, a, a whole um, system approach to that pregnancy to um, five agenda, bringing together as I say, early education and children centres and family support within one service, which I think is, is, is really important for us. And we have an integrated approach to early help. So within Camden, we have um, family workers working in the early year service, but also in a five to 13 service and youth early help. So it's a shared front door, all working together with a very similar approach and doing whole family work. And we have formal partnerships between children centres and health visiting. We really do value our health visitors in Camden and we commission through a section 75 partnership agreement and really view um, health visitors as central to our offer for families with young children. And we have ma maintained a strong children's centre offer, bringing together a range of co-located services. So, so this is our um, children's centre locality partnership model. We'll see Camden there um, divided into five localities. And within each of those localities, we have a, a, an integrated team. I won't, won't read them all out, but co-located in centres, we have health visitors, we have employability workers, we have housing staff. Uh, welfare rights advisors and so on so a really integrated model offering a range of both universal and targeted services so a real coming together and a real shared approach and by doing that and this has been we've been offering services in this way for um, several years now and by doing that we've achieved some fairly positive outcomes so our settings are good almost all of our childcare settings are good or outstanding um, all of our um, maintained nurseries are good or outstanding, as are our childminders. We offer um, a very strong family support service, and we target that at those very earliest years. So looking at the number of assessments we do for children under two, which is 50% of the total in early years. So a real focus on, on, on those earliest um, months and years. Some other um, outcomes data, which I think is useful, is that um, in terms of our welfare rights team we support families with their financial issues so last year we were able to gain for families an extra 1.4 million pounds in benefits they were entitled to so that obviously makes a huge difference in terms of the impact of poverty but also looking at some of the health outcomes um, the percentage of children in um, Camden that are obese is is lower than the average and declining so we are we are making some impact but what we really want to do is to challenge inequality. And if we look um, at our Camden vision, which is that all children have the best start in life, access to high quality early education and are ready for school at five, we want this to apply to all children in Camden. And sometimes I think the headline data masks some of the inequalities that exist within, uh, within populations. And so drilling down into the data, we can see that um, children who are entitled to free school meals in Camden achieve less well than their peers. And the graph on the right there just shows Camden there compared to our statistical neighbours. So this is the 60% 60, 60 of children in, in Camden who are entitled to free school meals um, achieve a good level of development at foundation stage. And that's compared with 71% globally of all children in Camden. So, so clearly something's not right. And I find that quite, that, that, that's, that's really, uh, something that needs to change. So um, also looking at some of the other research that, that, that I know um, we've all seen about, um, you know, if, if children have fallen behind by the time they're two, they're more likely to fall further behind than to catch up. So to really address these issues of inequality, we need to do something really early in those first thousand and one days. And Camden wants all children to have an equal opportunity to achieve well and live long and healthy lives. So although looking at headline data, we are doing okay as a local authority for our children we want to do much better so we are in the process of remodeling our service um, to um, develop a much stronger 
um, approach in those first critical 1,001 days. Um, responding really to that increasing and compelling body of evidence that a child's experience in, their first, in those first 1,001 days has the strongest influence on their future outcomes. So what can we do in that phase to make sure that all of our children have an equal opportunity to achieve well? And the research tells us that the early ex earliest experiences shape babies' brain development and have a lifelong impact on mental and emotional health. We know that that infant caregiver synchrony or the quality of the parent-child relationship is the foundation of that. And the developing infant brain relies on the parent to organize its own processes and emotions. And that parent-child interactions can alter brain structure. So this is fundamentally important. And I know the quote from um, Dr. Freiberg is now 30 years old, but still certainly resonates with me. So the new knowledge about early development and relationships is a treasure that should be returned to babies and their families as a gift from science. So what are we doing? Um, we're investing more um, in Camden in those first 1,001 days by prioritising this work. And we are very lucky that we have um, a group of, of, of members, council members in, in Camden, who really understand the importance of this work or are enabling us to invest in this, in this critical time. So we are investing more money in a universal offer for parents in that perinatal period, that first year, um, redesigning our services um, and the offer for families and their children focusing on the first thousand and one days, as I've said, with a real aim around narrowing that gap between disadvantaged children and their peers so that all Camden children have the best start. So our new service model, which we are introducing uh, this year, starting to introduce this year, has a much stronger universal offer. Um, we are introducing eight contacts for all families from antenatal to two years, rather than the standard five. Um, that's going to be based around two evidence-based programs. That's both the Brazelton New Observation Tool and PCPS, which some of you may be familiar with, um, which is a model that has been running in Spain, which again brings um, experts into the preventative world. And I think that's, that's what's so strong about it. It's using our health visitors who are partnering with us and delivering this, but also child psychologists in really supporting parents and developing that strong relationship with their, with their baby. We also want to strengthen our focus on community, looking at you know, the work around family hubs and so on, really wanting to make our centres more open access, um, bringing parents you know, much more centrally into the running of these services, you know, working on reception desks, those kinds of things, so that they are the centres are run by parents for parents and supported by the local authority. We're developing stronger links with our primary schools, really wanting to make sure that the work we do in early years is then continued and followed up uh, when children get into school. And I talked earlier about our early help offer extending into school aged children with a very similar approach. So, so that feels very joined up. We have locality partnerships, which I described earlier. And we're also doing some work around um, a trauma informed approach. So through our locality partnerships, we're introducing uh, some concepts around trauma informed work and, and helping us all to work together to, um, to support a lot of our families who have experienced significant trauma. And the parent champion approach is, is what is really how we're bringing parents into that kind of um, planning, development, delivery of our services. So we have a team of about 50 parent champions now from all of our communities who are helping to shape our new approach. And also, obviously, although we are focusing um, on developing a stronger universal offer, that needs to be backed up by strong, high quality targeted services. So early help, I've used the old terminology here, so universal plus and universal partnership plus services by health visitors and referral pathways for, uh, for mental health and, and other um, specialist needs. So um, a, a strong, much stronger offer. Um, and this is our new pathway. This is what we hope to achieve. Um, I know you can't read the detail because the slides are quite small, um, but our community hubs really bringing together all of these issues. So um, focusing on early education through our team of quality advisors and um, peer support with our parent champion programme, um, trauma informed community approach. So really understanding trauma and the impacts that have that, that has on, on, on families, looking at um, perinatal um, involvement and also looking at fathers 
uh, we have great um, in, engagement from fathers actually, particularly throughout things like our birth to um, a bump to baby program, looking at antenatal services and so on. I think that's that's really important that we continue to develop that and a stronger focus on universal services, as I say. And they, the, the table on the right really shows us how the balance is shifting um, to a stronger universal approach and, and supported by those, those strong targeted services. And these, um, this is what we're hoping to achieve um, by our introduction of our new service model. So a higher percentage of children who achieve a secure attachment at two, um, where there was a lot of data around about the importance of a secure attachment. And uh, we believe that the programs we're introducing can, can deliver a significant increase in the percentage of children with a strong attachment. We want to decrease the inequality gap we already making some impact here, but we want to, to make sure, as I said earlier, that all families, all children have the best opportunity. We want to um, increase the percentage of children who uh, achieve the expected level of development at the end of the foundation stage, particularly those that are entitled to free school meals. And we want to support um, Camden families and children so that fewer children have already fallen behind by the time they start school. If we can really level things out by the time children are five, then I think, um, we will begin to make a real difference. So I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of the Camden approach. Thank you. Debbie, thank you very much. There's an awful lot of uh, material and statistics and food for thought there, and particularly the, the, the value of interagency uh, and team working. Um, there. So great. Uh, we've had some uh, comments on the, on the chat. We will circulate the slides after the meeting if all the presenters are happy for us to, uh, to do that. So you don't need to furiously scribble down the information. Um, right, and thank you for keeping to time as well. So we're one minute ahead of show, which is almost unheard of. But we're now going to go to uh, Surrey Parklands. We've got three presenters from the Integrated Care Systems developed in Surrey. We're going to start with Trudy Mills, and with Trudy, we've got Vicky Williams and Catherine Hollins. So, Trudy, can I hand over to you? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, unfortunately, Vicky can't join us today, so I'm going to cover her slides and um, her daughter's very poorly. So I'm sending all our thoughts to Vicky and her daughter. I'm just going to share my screen. Right. Okay. okay, so m m our slides are... Yeah, are we... working. Is that great? Brilliant. So yep, that's uh, working one so far so good. <laughs> okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yep, all fine. Carry on. Great. Um, so uh, in Surrey, um, um, we're going to focus on our kind of strategic approach um, um, through our integrated care system. Um, I'm Trudy Mills. I'm the director for Women, Children and Learning Disabilities of Surrey Heartlands um, ICS. Um, and our approach very much is around integration and how integration has enabled us to prioritise everything we've heard um, so far um, in, in this meeting um, to prioritise um, our women and children's um, health needs from right from conception all the way through um, the uh, life, life course of the child and, 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 and the women. Um, but you may be asking why, why Surrey, because on the... Um, externally, Surrey is quite a um, affluent area to live, nice green leafy suburbs, but actually as, as, as Debbie's described and Alison has described, if you dig down, we do have um, some, some really wide health inequalities in Surrey. Um, we have children being born in, um, in, in, in deprived areas and um, that will die six years earlier than the most affluent. And, and we've heard about, um, Debbie described, the level of development at the end of reception um, is pretty good for most children in Surrey. But if you look at children on free school meals in Surrey, only 29% will have a good level of um, development. I mean, and that is just stark. I mean, how can that be in 2021? And and, and also within Surrey, um, we have one of the largest ethnic minority um, groups, the Gypsy Roma Traveller community, um, and they have one of the, well, they have the poorest health outcomes um, in, in, in Surrey. Um, so I, I can't stress the importance of having that system leadership behind you um, as part of the integration um, and collaboration journey as, as, a, as an ICS. Uh, um, 
it's very easy for children and particularly in community services for children to be the kind of poor relation in, in system planning, in commissioning. You are fighting against a and &E, waiting times, cancel waiting times. But in Surrey, um, th there was a real drive and recognition that for everything that's been described that's gone on before, that if we didn't have that generational change in Surrey and invest in our children, we will still see um, hospitals full of obese uh, adults, smoking, cardiovascular, um, poor mental health across um, for men and for women and for, um, parental poor mental health. So unless we do something and invest now, nothing will change. Um, and we started to look at um, how we get that message across the whole system. So right from our chief exec at Surrey County Council and our accountable officer at Surrey Heartlands ICS, there was a pledge that we would have generational change as one of our key key four, one of one of our four key priorities um, for Surrey Heartlands. Um, we managed to get um, um, business plan criteria changed so that the focus wasn't on return on investment in one to two years, that the focus is on prevention and the impacts of long-term health outcomes, public health outcomes and system sustainability rather than seeing the return on investment, although Alison's size is, was very powerful, but some of those return on investments are over a five to 10 year period rather than what you'd get in one or two years. And often um, I find in my experience that um, within the first 1,000 days, if you can't demonstrate that you're going to make those savings in the first year, then you often fall over at the first hurdle in terms of trying to attract funding and investment. Um, so having that system leadership behind and having a director like myself um, leading the work in, in, the, in Surrey Heartlands has meant that we've got a really high profile, great shared understanding, fast decision making, um, and a children's system network that's inclusive and informal and not hierarchical. So it's who matters sits around the table, the subject matter experts, the, 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 the women, the clinicians, the commissioners, the providers, all sit to come together on a weekly basis to look at what more can be done universally targeted and that proportion universalism offer across, across Surrey. So in terms of, and this is an example of how, if you've got really good um, key characteristics in place around system leadership, how quickly we can mobilize services and come together to respond to uh, our most vulnerable communities and our most vulnerable communities in need. And our GRT community was significantly impacted during the pandemic early on in the first lockdown. We had families, um, moms that were pregnant, very young babies, um, not able to um, um, uh, implement all of the lockdown measures around um, infection control because there was no clean water for hand washing. Children suddenly went to home, edu home educated um, facility, uh, having to be home educated within very um, limited accommodation um, with no laptops and Wi-Fi and 4G for children to be able to access their education. We needed the multi-agency response um, to the pandemic. And because we had those relationships in place, we had really strong working relationships due to the collaboration across our local authority with our districts and boroughs with our education colleagues. My role, I sit across both the local authority and the CCG and the provider. So we were very quickly able to mobilize a multi-agency response into our camps um, and make sure that the districts and boroughs were, were held to account to ensure that they had fresh running water, um, that they were able to put the infection prevention control measures in, that we had a digital mobilization team that went out and made sure that all the families had laptops and they had the roaming, um, um, SIM cards so they could pick up um, a 3 and 4G signal um, and we did that within probably within 48 hours it, as, as usual these things happen or come to your attention on a Friday afternoon but our teams worked all hard, really hard over the weekend and were able to respond very quickly and um, and then similar vein in terms of when it was time for when we had the vaccine available we were able to mobilize very quickly our vaccination program into, into the camps. 
I'm going to hand over to my colleague Catherine now to talk to you a little bit more about why relationships are so important um, when you're developing your strategic leadership in a system in an integrated way. Thank you Trudy and uh, hello everybody great to see you this morning. I'm a consultant parent child and family psychiatrist and psychotherapist so the 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 aspect of relationships is absolutely key in what Surrey Heartlands are doing. And I think Trudy's already described that very well, but I'm just gonna add a little bit to that. Um, the, the way in which Surrey Heartlands have really thought and continue to think about, as Trudy said, who sits at the table and the way in which we connect and communicate. So that's happening on lots of different levels. And it's all about how we build trusting relationships between all the different people and agencies, voluntary sector across Surrey, when we think about what does it mean to support a baby, a family at the beginning of life in those first thousand and one days, uh, what, what do they need? And they need safe space, they need safe trusting relationships, and we're trying to model that in the way we uh, support practitioners to meet each other and to get to know each other and the way in which agencies trust each other and work together. So that's happening in all sorts of different ways. And the fact that I have, a, have my role, for example, in, in the programme is, is testament to that in having a clinician working day to day with commissioners, with directors around thinking about how we connect and collaborate across the different systems. Um, one of the um, key parts that, that, that we're holding on to as we plan our programme is how we connect with the voluntary sector and how we connect um, with all of our different um, partners and how we think about the community and peer support, which, which of course was mentioned in Camden as well. So our programme is thinking about relationships, attachment right at the beginning, but also thinking about relationships across the system, how we make things more accessible and increase opportunity for the inequalities that we see and how we think about peer support. We have the next slide, Trudy. So just to give you some examples um, uh, briefly of what this means, to add to Trudy's example of our GRT community, um, the fact that there are these trusting relationships building up all the time means that, for example, Homestart, uh, one of our voluntary partners, have been able to set up groups for mums and babies during lockdown. So it's about the micro, you know, thinking about the relationships between mums and babies and what we can do on the ground. And that's been a, a connection with health visitors, which we have been supporting. Another example has been to take the opportunity to support NICUs, babies in neonatal intensive care, uh, through offering psychotherapeutic uh, input, which we've not been able to do before. And that's again been through the First Thousand Days programme, uh, being, being responsive. Um, and the third example is, again, coming to this important multi-agency working. And what this has meant is things like, during the last year, um, collaborating over webinars um, with local authority, with different agencies, voluntary sector, with parents, um, to say, uh, what do children need in order to survive and thrive? How do we support right from the very beginning? We've also thought about ways of doing Facebook Lives, uh, phone line accessibility, and also reflective spaces for uh, agencies to meet. And part of that is not only for the individual practitioner, but a way of getting to know each other in our roles. I hand back to you, Trudy, to close. Thanks, Catherine. So do we just wanted to close on some of the challenges um, that we've come up against? Um, and I've, I've alluded to one around short short-term funding streams um, and, and, we just, we, and Alison also talked about long-term investment in health visiting. I think that is absolutely critical and key. Um, and, and, and my thoughts were around, you know, we have the Ockden um, review for maternity services and a, and a real key and drive to for workforce investment in maternity. I think we need a similar, a similar um, workforce mandate for health visiting. Um, the, the, the national policy um, um, doesn't always enable integration and a shift to focusing on prevention. Um, that there is a, a there is a um, general tendency, and we saw it in the um, in the long term plan um, on on um, high need and and, um, and and complexity rather than universalism. 
and, and, and for all families. So having, having more policy, national policy focused on, um, on universal and how important that is um, would be really, really, really helpful in terms of particularly for ICSs as a, as a lever to further investment. Um, and I've also mentioned a shift on a needing one to two year return on investment um, and are much more focused on long term health outcomes and generational change as a different type of investment. Thank you. Great, Trudy, thank you very much. And Catherine for um, that. Again, there's an awful material there and that's, I'm sure it's going to interest some questions which are appearing already. Can I remind people to put their, their questions in the Q&A box uh, now and we'll start to pick those at the end of the presentations. We've got one further presentation. We've now got um, officials. We've got Philippa Baker from Legis the Legislation Programme Team and Dorian Kennedy is the Director of Children, Families and Communities, and particularly to talk about how the Health and Care Bill will influence local partnership working for the Nought to Twos. So, Philip, are you going to start off, please? Hi, thanks so much uh, for inviting us here today. It's been really um, fascinating and helpful to hear the um, case studies and, and the experts um, here. So uh, we really appreciate you being invited. Um, and uh, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm the Deputy Director for the Legislation Programme Team. So I cover the full content of um, the bill um, that will be introduced to Parliament shortly. I don't know if Dorian, you want to just introduce yourself. Um, Yep. Hi, so my name is Dorian Kennedy. I'm a Deputy Director in the Department of Health and Social Care and I head up the Children, Families and Communities team. Thanks, Philippa. Thanks, Dorian. So what we're going to do today is that I'm going to talk a bit about the bill, the structural reforms that we're proposing um, and how we're approaching the legislation. And then Dorian's going to talk a bit about the um, sort of conception to age two aspects and, and the opportunities that we see there. Um, so um, firstly, on how we're approaching uh, the, the legislation, I was really um, uh, pleased to hear a lot of the discussion focusing on things like leadership, relationships and partnerships, focus on prevention, um, more long term outcomes, targeting different parts of the population, because really what this bill is about is trying to um, support um, culture change um, and also to go with the grain uh, of what the system's already trying to do around integration. So um, it was good to hear uh, that, that those sorts of things um, are being reflected in, in, in the practice on the ground. And just a bit of background on the bill itself. So this is a really big bill. Um, it covers everything from structural reform um, on health and care to data sharing, fluoridation, obesity, workforce. Um, it's really, really big. But today I'm going to focus on uh, mainly the uh, integrated care system aspects of the bill and the opportunities there to support um, uh, people in the early years. Um, so uh, the bill is also aiming to, to learn from the experience of the response to the pandemic. And we had a couple of examples there um, uh, from Trudy about how the pandemic has really brought people together um, and really strengthened the case for integration and joined up approaches. Um, and it also builds on the NHS's own proposal proposals um, set forward um, uh, following their long-term plan. Um, so it's underpinned by three key aims, um, working together to integrate care, stripping out needless bureaucracy um, and improving accountability and enhancing public confidence in the system. And there's also further measures um, on supporting social care, public health, patient safety and quality in the NHS. And our approach to this legislation, as I've said, it's about going with the grain um, Secretary of State often talks about evolution, not revolution. So when this bill lands, it should be a sort of soft landing and it should feel like it's supporting the system to continue to deliver in the way that they um, are trying to. It should remove barriers, remove the need for complex workarounds. It's not an entirely new system theory that we're planning to, um, to impose uh, on the health and care system. And we want to deliver the legislation in a way that builds in flexibility and two specific types of flexibility. So firstly, um, to enable different areas to implement the bill in the way that works for them. So we recognize there's a huge variety um, of geographies out there um, for integrated care systems. There is no one size fits all. Um, and uh, the second type of flexibility we want is for the system to be able to adapt over time. So some of the feedback we've had about um, previous legislation is that it's just too rigid and hasn't been able to move um, with the system. So what that means is that when the bill is introduced, when you see it, um, 
it won't be prescribing every last detail of how we intend the system to work in legislation on the face of the primary. Um, and that means we need to work really closely with others on implementation, making sure that we have the right guidance in place, the right enablers to make the system work well. And we've been hearing about what some of those enablers might be today. Um, uh, so that's really helpful. I'm just going to say a couple of words about integrated um, care systems and what you're going to see in the bill um, when it's introduced. So um, ICSs are essentially collaborative institutions that enable organisations across the health and care system to come together. So NHSE have said that the core purpose of ICSs is to improve outcomes in population health and healthcare tackle inequalities in outcomes, experience and access, enhance the productivity uh, and value for money of our services, often through joining up better or integrating better, um, and to help the NHS support the broader social and economic development of their areas. Um, so we really have quite broad ambitions for ICSs. Um, it's really important to us that they feel um, like a more equal partnership across health and local government um, as well to bring together that full range of services. Um, and some of the opportunities that this presents uh, for young people include around, um, you know, population health approaches that target infants, children and young people's health and mental health, um, enhanced data sharing within systems, reducing inequalities, particularly focusing on the opportunities from younger age groups. We've heard some of that today and better links to wider partnerships, for example, across just the education system um, or into social care, children's social care, etc. Um, so uh, we see lots of opportunities there. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about the um, structure that we're designing uh, for ICSs. So um, we are in uh, creating um, a system that brings together health and local government partners. We are bringing together two very different systems, um, which can uh, which present, present its own challenges. Um, what we're trying to do really is to support two different types of integration um, through ICSs. That's integration within the NHS. So, you know, from primary up to acute care, across physical and mental health, all of that sort of um, integration. Um, but we also want to support integration between the NHS and with wider partners, local government in particular, but also um, wider public services um, and beyond that to uh, the voluntary sector, etc. So uh, our design for integrated care systems has two elements. Um, it has what we're calling an integrated care board or the NHS ICS body. So this is the statutory body um, that is the successor body to CCGs. So all of CCGs CCG functions currently um, will transfer to the Integrated Care Board. Um, this will be a statutory body. Um, local government will sit on the board of that body. Um, it will bring together different providers within a patch. Um, primary care will be on that board um, and uh, they will be tasked with producing a health plan. And then the second element of ICSs will be um, what we're calling an integrated care partnership or a health and care partnership. This is a statutory committee. Um, it will have um, uh, health, uh, the NHS and local government at its heart, and then they will be able to bring together a really wide range of partners. Uh, we are not prescribing um, who should be on that partnership in legislation because we want local areas to design it um, in the way that, that works for them. And that's where we see a huge opportunity for bringing in wider services, the voluntary sector, providers, etc., cetera, um, whatever works for that area. Um, the final thing I'll say structurally before just handing over to um, Dorian is that we uh, see a huge an important role for places within systems. So the sort of local authority footprint. Um, we're not gonna be legislating for that heavily in the primary, because again, we don't think um, that, that it's, um, it, it's something that needs to be set out in the primary legislation. We think it's something that's best designed by local areas, but we are providing that um, the joint strategic needs assessments that are produced by health and wellbeing boards, those will be the kind of golden thread that uh, runs from place level up to systems. Systems will be required to take those into account um, and those will hopefully be the building blocks of a strong um, foundation at place level flowing upwards to system level decision making. I'll just hand over to Dorian now. 
Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Chair. Um, so regarding uh, conception to age two, um, I think it's important just to refer to the um, Early Years Healthy Development Review, um, as you referred to um, earlier, Chair, led by uh, Andrea Ledsom, which has really set out the, uh, the vision um, for this uh, age group going forward. Um, I expect most people on the call are familiar with the action areas um, that were that have been uh, being taken forward under that uh, review. I think it's just worth touching on a couple particularly the first one, the seamless support for new families. And a, a critical component of that is working across um, national and local government with the NHS to ensure the Start for Life offer is at the heart of local healthcare commissioning and is integral to, to integrated care systems. I think that's a very important statement in that review and really lands this um, age group um, importantly in, in the ICS landscape. Um, just touch upon uh, the, the other couple of areas. Um, continuing and improving the Start for Life offer, I think is a really important um, action area. They're obviously all important, but just um, picking on a couple from this discussion. Um, and it, it clearly recognizes um, Start for Life offer isn't static. Um, it's going to, um, evolve, develop based on better evidence, sharing best practice. And I think that's a, a theme that comes across um, very strongly in the review about learning and sharing best practice as we go forward. And the other key issue is, is leadership. Leadership nationally for this age group, but also leadership locally um, and, uh, and how this um, age group can be best represented um, both nationally and locally. Um, there's I think there's a lot of opportunities and uh, regarding the health and care bill for, for infants, children and, and young people. Um, clearly, ICSs uh, can enable a greater ambition on tackling uh, health inequalities and looking at the wider determinants of health. And I think um, uh, Debbie touched on some of that in her talk about the excellent work being done in Camden. Um, certainly those issues of the wider determinants sort of by definition are outside the scope of the direct scope of the health and care sector, but it's vital we can build, we can use ICSs to sort of increase the reach across the system so we can look at wider determinants of health in helping us tackle inequalities. Um, ICSs should be able to help us develop very broad partnerships just be beyond the NHS and very much into local services in education in the VCSE sector to ensure that we can get ambition, really ambitious approaches to improving outcomes. Um, as Philip had touched on, ICSs will deliver population-based um, uh, health approaches across you know, quite a broad footprint of an ICS. But that will allow obviously targeting uh, different segments of the population depending on need. So there's um, really prioritization uh, of services and activity based on, on, on need, which I think is an important area. Um, ICSs, of course, will, will play a central role in delivering in the, uh, the six action areas of the Best Start for Life vision, as we've just touched on. So I think those are important opportunities within the health and care bill for infants. With regard to statutory responsibilities, I think it's just important to touch on statutory safeguarding responsibilities in particular. The Chief Executive Officer of the Integrated Care Board will take on the statutory responsibilities for safeguarding that are currently held by the CCGs. So that statutory function will transfer from CCG to the Integrated Care Board. And I think um, as we move to the, the, the new system, I think there is an opportunity for guidance um, around ICSs to set out how structures and responsibilities can work at the sort of the, the place level that Philippa touched on, as well as expectations regarding, for example, the delegation of the duty within an organisation and issues around funding contributions in a very much, obviously, it's a a multi-agency safeguarding partnership um, based on uh, local authority boundaries. So I think we, we want to ensure um, real flexibility in the system, but we need to explore where guidance will be of real value to ICSs um, uh, 
particularly in the safeguarding space. We're engaging NHS England on these issues and we've recruited a health facilitator to really help us reach out into um, NHS organisations to work on the child, child safeguarding uh, aspects in particular. And I think also we should recognise the shift to ICS does offer an opportunity to sort of re-engage local leaders to clarify work stream supporting children, um, including the safeguarding area. Um, and we're really keen to learn from areas, sorry, Heathlands, for example, Heartland, sorry, um, and, and Camden about the systems they're setting up and we can learn from them and share that learning across the system. As for next steps, um, you know, as the new structures are developed, we have an opportunity to address some of the long-standing issues around how the NHS joins up with partners to support and safeguard infants and, and of course, children and uh, young people. Um, we're really uh, aiming for this much stronger so, you know, strengthen partnerships between the NHS and local authorities, enabling more joined up planning and provision um, with the aim of enhancing the services that infants receive. And we also see this as a, as a great opportunity to support improved health outcomes for children. Um, I think we've, we've heard from other speakers about some of, the, some of what's been achieved so far in the current system and taking the best of that um, through the integrated um, care systems will, will really help. And I think we do have the opportunity of addressing um, wider determinants of health. So we can address health inequalities sort of much earlier in people's lives, which I think can make a key difference. Within the department, we, we continue to, to, to bring the various parts of the department together working on, on children's health, whether that's um, children and young people's mental health, health visiting provision and um, SEND uh, policy areas. We're working across uh, with, with our partners across Whitehall, other departments, particularly Department for Education, um, MHCLG and Home Office uh, on a range of children's issues. And um, as I mentioned, we, we're, we're reviewing existing guidance and regulations in light of the bill to determine where changes need to be made and, and would help. Thank you, Chairman. Dorian, thank you very much. And Philippa, it's really useful to have the, the sort of departmental speak on how this reports and all the work that's been done is going to be translated into, into action and the interaction between national, central level and local uh, government and all the other local agencies working in local partnerships. And a really key point that Philippa mentioned earlier is, or there's a national template to make sure that this works locally, it'll have to local partners to decide on their specific design, how best it fits into their local uh, authorities, local uh, areas and local uh, environments. And that's absolutely uh, key to make sure that people can feel ownership of this uh, at a local level as, as well and to use it. Now, I'm Andrea, I was going to come to uh, first because obviously a lot of points have been made about uh, Andrea's um, uh, review and I'm sure I'd just like to make some comments. Then we've, we've got a under half an hour for uh, questions. We only had two questions so far in the Q&A. So it's going to be a short session and people come up with some more things, but there's a lot of thought there. So leave your questions in that box and we'll come to as many as we can. Andrew, can I come to you next? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, first of all, just a huge thank you to Debbie and to Trudy and everyone who's spoken, Alison and to Dorian and Philippa. Um, it's, it's, I just really wanted to try and bring a couple of strands together because certainly what Debbie was talking about with the new um, 1001 Days offer in Camden, that is almost spot on what we're calling for in the Best Start for Life review. And in the Best Start for Life review, we now sit as a Start for Life unit within health, so with Dorian and Philippa, and uh, Matt Hancock is totally on side with the six action areas, which include, as we know, a Start, a start for Life offer joined up for every family, family hubs, both physical and virtual, open access, universal, um, better support for the workforce, um, better focus on um, co-training and support for the workforce and so on. So I just really wanted to simply say all of what I've heard today is absolutely music to my ears. You can rest assured that the civil service team that was numbered six people in phase one is now rising to 25 people. It has the prime minister's backing. 
It's sitting in health, but we have three ministerial sponsors, Vicky Ford as the Minister for Children, Joe Churchill as the Minister in Health, and Penny Mordant as the Minister in Cabinet Office. And the idea of Penny being involved is because Cabinet Office have the job of pulling Whitehall together. And as we know, the 1,001 critical days impacts, it's actually eight Whitehall departments, for goodness sake. And, um, you know, we've all mentioned leadership, the importance of leadership at the local level, but so too the Prime Minister has agreed, as we know, that there will be a Cabinet member who is given the overall responsibility for the Start for Life. So I will continue to chair this team of up to 25 civil servants until the end of the next spending review, which is next April, so that I can effectively be closely involved with making that spending review submission. Now, as you will all know, um, if you're involved with local authorities and spending, there's a big lead time for spending reviews. So the evidence that Alison gave on the preventable costs of intervening early, that kind of stuff is absolute gold dust for my review. We've got a fantastic small team of civil servants, as I say, in this Start for Life unit who are pulling together the spending review submission. That needs to actually start in August. So we don't have long to collate information. So if you've got any thoughts on where we can get more data, obviously what we're trying to do is to provide evidence of the incredible um, value in intervening early to prevent later cost to the exchequer. So forget the kind of moral and the everything that we all argue about oh, until the cows come home. This is about the hard money and that's where we need the evidence. And we should all be absolutely focused on that. But in terms of what the Start for Life review is doing, it is exactly what you are all saying. It's trying to join things up. It's making um, open access and universal services to destigmatize. So the Start for Life offer will be both a universal offer and a universal plus offer. We're going away from talking about targeted services. It'll be universal, which includes midwifery, health visiting, mental health support, and breastfeeding support at a minimum. And then universal plus will be everything from debt advice to couple counseling to smoking cessation, whatever else a local authority area wants to put into it. So I just really want to simply say we are all absolutely on the same page. We'll be reaching out to everybody on this call, but particularly to those from local authorities. We are intending to um, effectively go out and evangelize our Start for Life offer to every single local authority. But we really do want to start with the kind of best in class. So we will, I tell you now, be coming directly to you after this call and a number of my team are on the call and we will be coming to you to talk about, I mean, Debbie, there's I think three things which I won't go into now, which I would say, just tweak this and tweak that and you are absolutely the best in class. And then of course, what we'll be looking for is those local authorities to help us to evangelize to other local authorities. So we are all over this and I just think this is fantastic to hear what you're all saying today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Andrew. You always make slightly menacing a fine art, which is uh, great. So what's really good is the continuity that Andrew is going to provide through to next year and hopefully funds then being made available to this uh, a reality and working with now in large team civil servants from across departments is really, really crucial to, uh, to that. So um, everybody's by their beds ready to get a call from Andrew's team to, to help in all of this. Right, now we've got several questions. There are a number of questions uh, specifically for uh, officials. I take a couple of the other questions, some of our earlier speakers and any of themes from, from Sari or, or Karen um, or Alison, feel free to chip in with this. There's one right at the beginning from Carol who asks, given current variability of professional services, how important would you judge parenting preparation programs uh, to, to be? I might come to you first, Alison, on, uh, on that. Um, and then Lydia, there's a, a very long question, which I'm not going to read it all out. It's in the Q&A session. Uh, as we've heard from Trudy, support for babies and families is not just an issue for the most deprived um, areas. And how do you go about getting local authorities to make sure that they get it and it's uh, on their priorities as, uh, as well? And obviously that's going to be a big challenge between central government and working with local agencies as, uh, as, as well. So shall I, um, Alice, do you want to take that as then anybody else from the Sea or Camden uh, teams like chip in as well? Yeah, I'm happy you to wave, You that. wave at me. Yes, Catherine's waved at me. Good, fine. Caught Catherine. Okay, Alice, now to you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Our parenting programmes really helpful. Some of them have um, excellent outcomes for families. Uh, what I would say is that... Um, 
we need to look at everything through the lens of the, the most disadvantaged and the most vulnerable who we know are the least likely to step forward and volunteer to join a program like that. We also know they have the highest rate of dropout. So it's, it all comes back to relationships, doesn't it? It's, it's having that person to come alongside the family for them to actually share the things that really matter to them. And that takes time. You won't get that on the first contact. You'll get some of it. So it's, it's having the time to, to get alongside the family. Um, and then for some families, they, they, they will join a program like that which is fabulous and for others they won't and they'll need that universal safety net of somebody to to deliver a not one size fits all program to support that particular family but we mustn't lose any of these children and families along the way we need to it's about a choice isn't it i know andrea's talked about that a lot giving choice and then families will choose um you know which which suits them best shall i make a Thanks. comment catherine then yeah. Debbie. So I think it's a great question and um, it's something we talk about that um, it's also about parenthood and about being a parent as much as uh, learning skills to, to, to parent, if you see what I mean. And what's in a good parenting programme like Circle of Security is thinking about relationship development. But that's not just about between a parent and a child, it's between a parent and a practitioner and then the relationships across the system. So um, I think just like Alison said, it's about the relationships and finding ways of supporting a new parent with how they uh, find their way through the journey of parenthood, especially in this first thousand and one days. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Debbie from, from Camden. And I think Trudy, are you waving as well? <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I echo really what my what colleagues have, have said already. I think, um, the most important thing is the relationship that parents make with, with, with the people that support them. And that's um, one of the reasons we've taken the, or we are taking the approach that we are in Camden, that we want um, through our enhanced universal program for parents to be able to develop a really strong relationship with the practitioners that support them. Right. So they will see, you know, our, our ambition is that people will see, parents will see the same practitioner when they come to each of their eight contacts. Obviously we can't guarantee that, but that's certainly our ambition. So that you can really build that, that strong trusting relationship between parent and, and practitioner. I also think, um, Rebecca, what Catherine said really about kind of minding the minder, becoming a parent's a really difficult thing. And we have to really be, you know, to be sensitive to the um, emotional uh, you know, changes that, that happen when you become a parent and really support parents through that. And I think by, by developing that relationship, we're able to spot those stresses when they emerge and really be able to respond to those in a very sensitive way. And I also think um, why we're so um, committed to a universal approach is that things change so quickly in the in the very early years and so you know trying to identify families that might be more vulnerable you know pre-birth you know it, it is helpful up to a point but things are fluid and so you know stresses uh, arise change and develop during those first few months and years and so having a universal approach we're able to respond to those things as they happen rather than wait for you know a referral system which then identifies need and then refers on which often is is too late as we know so so yes i think the relationship's all important thanks debbie trudy i i wanted to go back a, a step further really and think, and think about um what what does good parenting look like in schools um and children and that positive parenting and positive relationships um which uh, has eroded over time in the school curriculum and how do we, uh, we've talked a lot about health visiting, but we you know with the role of kind of school nursing and, and, and the PHSE curriculum around um, preparing children for parenthood as well um, is really key. Um, so that as Debbie described and Catherine described that transition into parenthood, we can, expectations are kind of, you leave even one kind of lifestyle behind and moving into a different lifestyle that has more accountability and responsibility and recognising that transition. But how do we prepare our children for parenthood, I think is really key as part of this work. Thanks, Trudy. Um, now, there's several questions for the officials. So if, if and, and Doran, you could take some of these. Let me just um, get some of them from the Q&A. Um, you've spoken about local flexibility in the ACSs and a lack of prescription. Without some direction, the current variability that we've been discussing today will uh, continue. So perhaps you can sort of flesh out the, the statutory guidance relationship with formulate local plans that Philip, you uh, meant and I touched on as well at the moment. Um, and how does the current review of social care, social care fit with the move 
towards increased integration, given that suggestions that child protection may be separated off. Doran, you were talking about that. You might flesh out a bit uh, on this well, and it assumed that there refers to services for not to two-year-olds as well as old children. So, uh, Philippa, do you want to start and then, then come to Doran? Yeah, and there's another question about um, uh, people sitting on boards as well. So I might just address that question about flexibility sure. um, more good. generally. Um, so, um, so, so yes, this is a, a challenge that, that we hear. It's sort of getting that balance right between local flexibility, but prescribing um, where, where essential. So um, there will be statutory guidance. Um, there will be guidance for how integrated care boards should operate. Um, there'll be guidance on how integrated care partnerships should operate as well. Um, and as part of that guidance, there is an opportunity for us to put out some basic principles. Um, and um, I suspect we will want to engage um, with others on what those might uh, be and you know I'm, I'm sure this group will have lots of really interesting views on, on what we should put in there so um, uh, unless sort of Dorian has anything more to say I mean I think that's a work a piece of work that we'll be thinking about this year um, as we work towards implementation of statutory ICSs in April um, next year. Um, the other question is about um, uh, people sitting on boards and again it's a similar issue you know uh, there are a number of um, the way we're approaching um, statutory membership is uh, to um, not be too prescriptive. So um, the statutory membership of a board will really just be at least one trust, at least one representative of primary care, at least one representative of local authorities. That is very much a floor, not a ceiling. Um, and we expect local areas to come up with the right formulation for them. What we anticipate though, is not necessarily creating these enormous boards with trying to represent every single element of a big complex system, but we uh, anticipate that local areas might um, approach that slightly differently. So for example, some might have sub, sub boards, uh, advisory boards that focus on children or clinical expertise or, or whatever. We wouldn't want to sort of define in legislation a single way of doing it. Others might have really um, strong representation at place level. Um, so they might have um, uh, think that that's where they want to sort of prioritize the representation for children. And again, we don't want to sort of constrain that in legislation. The mechanism that we are putting in place is that each ICS will have to set out a constitution and explain how they are representing um, different groups at each level um, and they will have to um, publish that and that will be approved um, by NHSE. So um, that is the mechanism by which we can sort of look at how each ICS is structured and have a sense of, of whether it's um, uh, sort of reflecting best practice. Thanks for coming so on go the... to Doreen. Dorian, can you hold hold on just a minute? Can we before we get to Dorian, um, an issue that's come up in the in the chat before, and there's a, an anonymous question here about the voluntary sector, uh, which hasn't been mentioned much. And again, certainly within those uh, those local boards as as yeah. well, it wasn't within that checklist, which you say quite right was a was a minimum. So somebody is asking, in what were people practically engaging the voluntary sector? Because those small grassroots yeah. organisations are really good as link in to often hard to reach parts of local communities as well who are absolutely the people we need to get here with the best start life. Agree and I think we would see a really strong role for them particularly at place level as you say I think um, perhaps not on the statutory board uh, which is the CCG successor body but on the partnership board I think the guidance will likely say that we expect the VCSD sector to be involved and included in those partnership arrangements for exactly the reasons that you say so they should have representation at place-based level and at that system level um, but we won't be prescribing that again it's something that we can reflect in guidance rather than on the face right. of the bill. Okay, Doreen, could you could you take on the previous question and also um, another question because I I think we've lost out. Um, it's asking is the Star Life team pushing for a specific specific Star Life fund to deliver the vision, or is the investment going to be delivered to public health supporting families, etc.? Could you perhaps take the mechanics of that one on as well? Please? Yep, that's fine. Thank uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so with respect to the children's social, the the sort of child safeguarding arrangements I touched on. So I think. Um, just to be clear, and apologies if I wasn't, the, the child safeguarding arrangements, um, the, the legislation in, in effect remains unchanged in that space. What we are doing and what we are doing is um, transfer, up, updating the arrangements to take into account the move from CCGs to 
integrated care boards. So the current responsibility, as you know, it's shared between for child safeguarding is shared between the, the local authorities, the, the children's social care part, the CCG and police. And as we move to um, the new system, we will have the responsibility shared between the local authority, the integrated care board and the police. So we're just sort of updating that function as of a consequential amendment, if you like. Um, and that covers child safeguarding for um, all, all, all ages as currently is the case. Um, with respect to children's social, uh, the, the review, uh, the, the, sorry, the current review of children's social care, um, we're, we're linked in with the um, DFE team. So in, 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 in addition to having the, the, the local tripartite arrangement for, for child um, safeguarding, we have a national one. So the Department of Health and Social Care, Department for Education and Home Office work together in ensuring um, we're joined up at the national level on children's um, safeguarding issues. And we're, uh, we're sort of kept abreast of development on the on the um, the current review of children's social care. Um, I don't uh, see there being significant change going forward, but we'll just keep that under review um, as, as that review progresses. Um, with respect to the funding okay. issue, we come yep. on to that. So the the. Yep, um, the review, the early years healthy development review um, that committed to work with um, the department, um, MHCLG and Treasury to develop costed proposals to strengthen the start for life, work, life workforce. And they are proposals that are being worked up and uh, developed at the moment. And they will um, be, that will be one of the bids that goes into the spending review consideration um, in, in the coming months. Okay, can I, whilst we've got you both, and I know then Sam wants to, um, to come in, a um, couple of questions. Are you asking all local authorities to report back to you on their implementation plans for Start for Life in their areas and how will this plan be shared across all the local areas? And will the new bill be able to apply QA processes locally? Could there be a benchmarking measure for all to aspire to such a 95% parent supporting that they can access the support that they need in the first 1,001 days for uh, example, so you can't at the moment. Philip, do you want to comment on those two points? Then I'll go to Sally. Sorry, I think those points might actually be better for Dorian to answer. If you're still there, Dorian, yeah. I am, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I can't quite see the questions I'm going on. Uh, apologies. Um, so you asked about local authorities reporting in. Um, uh, I, I take it from what uh, Andrea Ledson said earlier, she'll be reaching out to all local authorities. So we'll be sort of actively engaging um, with all local authorities ac across the country uh, on on that. I couldn't quite remember. And the, and the question specifically question. asks how then the plan will be, sh how the how then that will be shared across the local the local areas. And then the the QA question, the last question within the QA, uh, Dorian, from the uh, anonymous yeah. attendee, is very vociferous. Uh, about the bill be able to apply QA processes locally. If you can have a quick look at that, please. So um, I think the, the first question was about sharing sharing results and sharing best practice. So that's something that that's a theme that comes across the the um, the review, the early years healthy development review, all the way through. So um, there's a major focus on how um, practice. Um, shared um, I think uh, Andrew Edson mentioned earlier about you know looking to places like Camden and Surrey for the excellent work they're doing and sharing that more widely so we uh, get that um, just read it I can probably chip in on this this last one so um, it's a really interesting point about the sort mm. of benchmarking um, measures for access to support I think there will need to be um, a process that is designed for oversight of, of ICSs and ensuring um, that they're being uh, that they're delivering effectively um, part of that will be um, through a CQC um, re oversight regime so they'll be looking at uh, leadership and how effectively um, uh, ICSs are delivering partnerships and um, integrated arrangements um, we haven't got to the level of kind of granularity or detail where we sort of 
identified specific metrics that we might be following but you know if there are things that we should be measuring um, it's helpful to know about them um, uh, and we can reflect on that as we develop the policy for implementation further. Great, great work from the officials thank you very much. Um, look we're almost out of time so I think Sally I come to you to to end up with us uh, as, as well because I think we've taken all the questions that I've seen in the uh, in the Q&A so to you. Yeah, well, uh, sorry, I, I, I had my own question to ask if that, if you don't mind. Um, I think, so I, I understand that there's kind of limits on what can be written on the face of legislation, but I guess there's a really fundamental question about who is responsible in the system for making sure there is a best start for life buffer. Is it a local authority or is it the ICS? Obviously it has to be done in partnership, but if I as a parent want to know you know, there isn't one, who should I go to? Or if the Secretary of State ultimately wants to kind of call people up and say, what's going on here? Who's sorting this out for, for babies in area X where they're not getting the support they need? Who does the Secretary of State call in? Does he call in the local authority or does he call in the ICS? And and I, I still, I think I don't understand who where ultimately responsibility sits. And I wondered if you kind of knew that. I, I understand that how partnerships work, there needs to be local flexibility and exactly what's offered to totally get that. But ultimately, where does responsibility for not to sit? Well, uh, sorry, Dorian might want to chip in on this as well, but I mean, we're not changing sort of statutory responsibilities for children's services via these um, reforms. So, you know, the local authority will still be responsible for what it's responsible for, and um, the NHS will still be responsible for what it's responsible for. Um, but within that, um, ICSs are responsible for integrated and joined up services. And, you know, I think the Start for Life offer, I mean, it's not a statutory um, responsibility at the moment, but it will bring in lots of different statutory responsibilities. So so um, that will be something we'll probably want to look at um, in terms of, again, the oversight re arrangements and how we sort of articulate um, and set out the right guidance around delivery and, and oversight of, of, of these regimes, I think. Thank you, Philip. That's really appreciated. Lauren, do you want to add anything? Are you, ha are you happy with that? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy with that. No, I think that I think that, that's um, important is, to, uh, as Philip has said, that the responsibilities stay the same as they currently are, but the, 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 the ICS is about how do we make the, 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 the join up work more better. Catherine, you've just caught my eye, so I'm going to give the last word to, uh, to you before we sign off. It was actually a, a, a question to, to Dorian. Dorian, you mentioned about wider determinants of health and how we think more about the connection with ICSs. Um, and I was wondering if, if how we all uh, think about uh, you know, influencing and thinking about the, the relationship back from ICSs to other departments um, around the wider determinants of health, given Alison, some of Alison's shocking statistics at the beginning, how do we really think about that social equality um, agenda? It's a, a, a good question and a good challenge. Um, I think at the moment, one of the big issues um, being considered by the government is the whole levelling up agenda and what that means uh, in terms of um, policies and, and issues. And I think that's going to be an area where um, these sorts of considerations are taken, uh, are taken forward. Um, obviously levelling up and, and wider determinants, it's a huge area. So, um, but I think locally we're looking, you know, you, you all know better than me about issues around, you know, housing, um, employment, um, how do we best link up with um, healthy start vouchers for new parents, for example, air pollution are big issues. So I think there's issues around what can be done locally to address identify and address issues and working at the local level as well as what can be done nationally and I appreciate there are there are both areas need to take action if you if, if we are to reduce those address wider determinants right uh, it is 11 o'clock we have filled time perfectly I have taken every question in the q a box. I haven't had to utter the immortal words, you're on mute once, and nobody's broadband has failed to turn them into a Dalek, and the technology has worked. So without tempting Providence anymore, can I thank all of our speakers? Uh, there's an all lot of really interesting information there and a really helpful update on the process now that this is going to be translated into 
action through legislation, through funding, through central government templates, and working with uh, local agencies and update commander as well. So I think some really, really good um, uh, uh, material there. Thank you very much to all of our um, speakers for being so obedient and time timely. Uh, and everything you've said, thank you to all of those who've joined from outside, both by Zoom and on the YouTube live stream. We will share those uh, slides um, afterwards. Uh, people are asking about connection to the Ledson report. We put that within the chat. And all this material is available through the Parent Infant Foundation uh, website anyway, if, uh, if you haven't found things. So that information is, uh, is there. Uh, we will probably not be having another meeting now until the, uh, the, the recess. We'll give you details uh, of that. And obviously, there'll probably be quite a lot of start um, uh, progress to uh, update at that stage as, uh, as well. But thank you very much, everybody, for making that such a really helpful meeting, I think.